right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the latest edition of the Justice Simpkins School for Human Rights. Uh, before we begin, just a quick technical note. I do apologize for the Zoom issues. Um, there was something up with the, the actual link. Uh, I, my personal theory is that apparently even Zoom is taking a stance against critical race theory, but I digress. Um, so uh, glad to see folks are able to join us successfully this evening. Um, but this is the age we live in a technology where even Zoom is not entirely trustworthy. But <laughs> let's get on with the show this evening. Tonight, of course, uh, we are going to talk about a pivotal era in South Carolina history, going from the Revolutionary War all the way to the end of Reconstruction. Um, and before we get into that, I just want to offer a quick reminder for folks. Uh, we do want to once again encourage people to send in uh, music, poems, poetry reading. It could be a reading of something that has already been written, uh, whatever you wish. We just want to see uh, folks in the class uh, kind of get their creative juices flowing as we search for more introductions and endings to the class. And this evening, in fact, you're going to see one of your fellow students and what they produce as well. We want more folks to send things in. Uh, so, see, so please uh, contact Becky as soon as you can with an information, because I promise you, if I do actually follow through on the, the hip hop idea I posted a few weeks ago, we will all regret. So please get something in uh, the next uh, few weeks. Uh, okay, so the end of the Civil War, all right, apologies. All right, so got a lot to cover tonight. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, and what I really want to, to drill into everyone this evening, and this is one of the themes of the course, is that the state of South Carolina is one of the most pivotal places in the new United States in terms of crafting ideologies that are going to affect peoples across the country and across the world for centuries to come. And some of the key players in tonight's conversation that we're gonna have will be folks who, again, really influence the state and the world as a whole. So let me go ahead and uh, pull up my PowerPoint here. And tonight, it's, it's going to be really a two-part discussion. Number one, we're going to cover the era from the Revolutionary War until the actual secession crisis of 1860. And then we're going to get a bit into the Civil War. And at that point, I'll, I'll finish up, uh, take questions, of course, in the chat, and we'll go from there. So I'm really excited about tonight's conversation. Let's go ahead and get started. So the last couple of weeks, we have really built up to where South Carolina is in the middle of the 18th century. Um, and as a quick, quick refresher, when we're talking about this period, uh, we do want to take a step back to just before the Revolutionary War. Uh, and as your readings also point out, to think about the importance of the regulator movement, for example, that takes place in the 1760s. As you might recall, the regulator movement was essentially an expression of discontent from farmers who were leaving the low country and going towards the interior of South Carolina into the Midlands and the upcountry, and their discontent over the lack of law enforcement, the lack of government control in those areas. And as you may recall, about two weeks ago, I pointed out that with the regulator movement, one of the key leaders was, of course, Patrick Calhoun, who was the father of John C. Calhoun. Now, I'm pretty sure that everyone here already knows that his son, John C. Calhoun, is going to play a big role in tonight's class. But I want to point out Patrick Calhoun just as a reminder of the fact that with many political families in South Carolina, it's, it's usually multiple generations of folks who are getting involved in the state's politics. And the Calhoun family is just one example of that. As you may recall, a couple of weeks ago, we discussed the War of Independence as well. Um, and the readings also get into more detail about what's going on in South Carolina during the war. The most important thing to remember, however, is that during the War of Independence, thousands upon thousands of enslaved Africans uh, flee from plantations and other sites in South Carolina to freedom, whether it's fighting for the Americans, fighting for the British, going into the interior, hiding out in Congaree, the very institution of slavery itself is under siege during the Revolutionary War. And as you're about to see, the ideas behind abolition and ending slavery that come about during the Revolutionary War 
do not go away overnight. On the contrary, they become part of what South Carolina's elite are actually fighting against in the 1780s and 1790s. And that brings us to the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Now, by 1787, the United States has been independent for about four years. And for most of that time, the, gov the country has been governed by the Articles of Confederation, which, as you may recall, South Carolina signed on to back in 1777. However, what many leaders at the time were arguing was that the Articles of Confederation left behind a far, far too weak central government. There really was barely a semblance of a federal government to speak of. And so many of the elite across the country, including in South Carolina, felt it was time for a new constitution to govern the country, one that would give more powers to the federal government. Now, the question that we should be asking ourselves is, what sorts of powers are we talking about? And as you're going to see, the arguments over federal power are going to be arguments that are still with us today, as a matter of fact. But at the convention, one of the key debates is over the very fate of slavery itself. Now, South Carolina ends up sending a delegation that includes the following individuals, Charles Pickney, Pierce Butler, Charles Coltsworth Pickney, and John Rutledge. Now, all of these individuals, they had experience in government and politics stretching back to the Revolutionary Era, and for some of them, even before that. But when they joined the Philadelphia for the convention in 1787, they are all united around one principle, even if they disagree on various aspects of how the Constitution should work, uh, they all agree on one important thing. Whatever this Constitution looks like, it has to be, it absolutely must be a document that defends the institution of slavery. Delegates from South Carolina repeatedly warned their Northern counterparts that slavery is the one thing that is non-negotiable. Everything else they could, they could argue about and, and talk about and discuss but slavery is the one thing that they will not bear any or almost any compromise on. There will be an exception to that. We'll talk about it in a second. Just want to highlight a couple of these individuals again, um, just to kind of get the conversation going here. Uh, one of the delegates was Pierce Butler. Uh, oh, Butler is, is really interesting. He's one of the younger delegates of the convention, um, but he's in favor of two things. Um, what he's arguing about is the idea that we need a strong central government. And in order to do that, uh, we need to do a variety of things on the national level. But he's for a strong central government because he believes that is the best defense slave owners have against slave revolt. Again, you have to keep in mind that a lot of the delegates from the South, and especially South Carolina, um, really worry about the, the very present threat of slave revolt. I mean, again, for a lot of these folks, the Stoner Rebellion was only a few decades ago. The Revolutionary War was relatively recent. They understand that if the enslaved pulled their resources and pulled their power, they could change the state of South Carolina and destroy the institution of slavery if other folks aren't careful. Also, you have Charles Coatsworth Pickney, um, who, like the other delegates, is trying to create a stronger central government, one that can actually be respected by foreign powers. Um, but at the same time, he, like Butler and the other delegates from South Carolina, are also greatly concerned uh, with protecting the institution of slavery. Um, because again, they believe that a strong national government is absolutely essential for defending the institution of slavery. On the other hand, Pickney is also willing to compromise on one thing. Uh, he is willing to say that we could compromise on the issue of the slave trade itself, of importing enslaved Africans from West Africa and the Caribbean, uh, if it will buy us more time to protect the institution of slavery as it exists within the South right now. Now, I, I know that a lot of us have already gone over this before in civics courses in, in K through 12 or in college. But I want to bring up the Virginia plan just very quickly because it does come into play when it comes to the institution of slavery. 
Um, one thing about this is that the Virginia plan was really a way to kind of get the bigger states more representation in Congress. Again, at the time, there was this idea that the bigger states like your Virginia's and Pennsylvania's and New York's being larger in population uh, deserved more representation. Uh, this was, of course, opposed by the New Jersey plan, which had one legislature each state having one vote. This is closer to what the old Articles, Articles of Confederation was. Now, we all know about this part of the compromise. I think we've all heard about this before. We learned about it before in, in school and, and et cetera. But what I want to add to this is that at the same time as the Virginia and New Jersey plans are being argued about, there is also a debate going on at the convention about inserting into the Constitution a fugitive slave clause. Now, this is important to thinking about how the federal government works, because the argument that Pickney and Butler are saying is that if we're going to have a truly powerful central government, one of its responsibilities has to be capturing enslaved Africans and bringing them back to their owners in the South. By 1787, there are already several northern states, most notably Pennsylvania, that have either already abolished slavery or are on the road to abolishing slavery. And the fear many Southern delegates have at the convention is that unless there is a mechanism put in place that forces the federal government to get enslaved Africans back and send them back to their slave owners, then the problem of runaway slaves is going to be one that they will not be able to solve. Now, some Northerners like James Wilson of Pennsylvania and others oppose the Fugitive Slave Clause. They argue that the government should not have a right to interfere in bringing slaves back to their slave owners. But other Northern delegates decide to agree with the South to get this compromise through for the sake of getting the larger constitution uh, agreed to and sent back to the states for ratification. And again, this idea, this question of the ending of slavery is a really important. By 1787, these are the states that have either abolished slavery or have created a mechanism for gradual abolition. That is, they've set a date by which if you're an enslaved person, by this date, you'll be free. Or if you're an enslaved person, and you have children, your children will be free if they're born after the state, that sort of thing. Well, by 1787, Vermont, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, have all abolished or are about to abolish the institution of slavery. And by 1820, numerous other Northern states, such as New York, for example, will also create laws and guidelines about the gradual abolition of slavery. And so if you're a delegate from South Carolina, or if you're a plantation owner from South Carolina, you are well aware of the fact that slavery north of the Mason-Dixon line is well on its way to extinction. And your concern is, how do we defend slavery south of the Mason-Dixon line? How do we defend it and strengthen it in places like South Carolina? Now, this is where the Constitution's very um, structure comes into play. Um, so I mentioned before the Virginia plan, right? Uh, and I mentioned before one of the delegates being John Rutledge. Now, Rutledge actually serves on the committee that modifies the Virginia plan somewhat. Originally, the Virginia plan created two houses of Congress, both of them decided by um, population. But the modified plan creates one house, the Senate, that is equal in terms of representation, and the other house, the House of Representatives, that is dependent entirely on population. Now, where the rub comes in is, of course, the idea of, well, how do you count the enslaved, right? If you count the enslaved as part of your population, as many Southern delegates wanted, that would have given the South disproportionate power in Congress. And this is not just theoretical. Keep in mind that in the 1780s, the population of white and Black South Carolinians was roughly even. It was a slightly larger percentage of white than Black South Carolinians. By the 1820s, once again, the state will be majority Black. And so this is a, a critical question 
for the South Carolina delegation is one of the delegations across the South. And so they end up coming up with the three-fifths compromise, where instead of counting the enslaved as a, a, a full citizen for the, the purposes of, of voting apportionment in Congress, they count them as three-fifths of a citizen. Um, even with the three-fifths compromise, though, and this is especially critical as we discuss the 19th century, even with that three-fifths compromise, it still gives the South at least a dozen or 14 more congressmen than they probably should have had. Uh, historians have actually gone back and on the map on this. And if you take away those enslaved people, the South's um, power in Congress is greatly diminished, especially in the House of Representatives. They would have, have had far fewer representatives than they actually had during the 19th century. As it is, however, uh, Rutledge and other Southerners they decide to go along with this compromise for the sake of ratifying the Constitution. And Rutledge warns the Committee of Detail that he served on that the Constitution itself cannot ban slavery. This is a, a big thing. They, they will concede the power of the Constitution to control, say, the slave trade itself. But even in 1787, as the ink is not even dry on the Constitution, as the Bill of Rights is being debated about, about South Carolina is already saying the Constitution can do many things. It cannot, however, touch slavery itself. We might come back to that before the night's over, FYI. At the same time, uh, since this is a course on South Carolina history, and as you saw in your readings, the state of South Carolina is trying to create a new constitution for itself. And this is especially important because all the states are creating new constitutions that are going to uh, really parallel and fit in with the national constitution. And as your reading suggested, and this is a critical point, what you're seeing in South Carolina is a dividing line between the low country and the back country. Um, we discussed this with the regulator movement in the 1760s. This comes up a bit during the Revolutionary War, but a big part of South Carolina's political history, in addition to the issues of race that we will continue to discuss, in addition to the issues of ideology that we'll also discuss, there's this geographic dividing line between the low country and the rest of the state. And as you can see with the, the state constitution 1790, this comes into play time and time again. Uh, to make a long story short, the folks in the back country are begging the delegates from the low country to give the back country more support, to give them more political power in the state government. And so the low country delegates say, oh, you know, yeah, sure, that, that all sounds good. We, we, should, we should have more democracy in the state. So, of course, the logical conclusion they reach is to actually reduce the number of seats in the state legislature from 208 to only 124, which basically increases the power of the low country in the process. As you can see here, property qualifications to hold office actually become more onerous. You have to own at least 500 acres of land and 10 slaves or hold at least $11,000 worth of real estate holdings to actually run for and hold an office in South Carolina. Things, in fact, get so tense that the delegates from the, the state decide to actually create essentially two state governments. I mean, they have one governor, one legislature, and so forth, but they have two state treasurers, one in Columbia, one in Charleston. They have other key offices in Columbia and Charleston as well. Uh, again, Columbia was a relatively new city. It had just been founded in the 1780s because of the fact that the backcountry delegates had argued during and after the Revolutionary War that it was unfair to them that the state government was located in Charleston. So, of course, the solution to that problem was to simply create two state government offices, some in Charleston and the rest in Columbia. So, as you can see, South Carolina uh, is having some growing pains in the 1780s and 90s. While it's able to speak with one voice on a national level to defend slavery, at home, there are a lot of questions being raised about what the state's going to look like for the next generation of South Carolinians. Uh, even the very question of slavery itself takes on a different tenor and tone on the state level. Um, of course, with the 1790 Constitution, slavery plays an important role. Um, there's again a divide between the low country and the back country. 
there is fear amongst low country delegates from Charleston and elsewhere that the back country is becoming a hotbed of anti-slavery agitation. A big reason for the, or two big reasons for this are the following. Number one, most of the folks living in the back country are actually independent yeoman farmers. And so what wealth they're able to create and craft, they often do so without the direct use of enslaved people. Now you are going to see the slave enslaved population increase in the, the black country as well, especially as Dr. Edwards mentioned last week, once you start seeing more cotton being grown in the upcountry. But secondly, religion plays a role in this too. You do have a small Quaker population in the upstate. You have other religious denominations like Methodists, et cetera, who are also staunchly anti-slavery. The problem, however, is that even with the anti-slavery sentiment trickling upward in the upstate, every delegate from the back country in the General Assembly owns slaves. So again, while there is some anti-slavery sentiment in South Carolina, least of all from the enslaved themselves, when it comes to the power brokers in the state, in the state government, they were all staunchly pro-slavery. Of course, the issue of slavery in the 1790s is going to encounter its biggest test yet with the revolution in San Domingue happening in what is now present day Haiti in 1791. Now, the thing about the revolution in San Domingue or the Haitian revolution, is that by 1791, thanks to the American and French revolutions, along with about a generation or so of anti-slavery agitation in both America and Europe, you are starting to have more people questioning the institution of slavery. You've seen the beginnings of the abolitionist movement. But what makes San Domingue different is that the enslaved themselves are doing what white slave owners feared in South Carolina for generations. They have risen in full-blown revolt. Now, the Haitian Revolution could be a class or two or three by itself. It is an incredibly pivotal moment in the history of the Western Hemisphere and history of the world. If you haven't, I would highly recommend reading C.L.R. James, The Black Jacobins, if you want to get more information about the Haitian Revolution. But what I will say here relates to South Carolina specifically. Now, the white plantation elite in San Domingue, when the revolution breaks out in 1791, they look for help from all countries. They look for help from the French government back home in France. They look for help from the United States, look for help from the British. Anyone willing to help them put down a slave revolt, they appeal to. And one of the interesting things about the Haitian Revolution is that the plantation elite in San Domingue reach out to, amongst other places, South Carolina. They make a direct appeal to the State Assembly in South Carolina for uh, weapons, for supplies even for troops. Um, and Governor Pickney has this great line. He says about the revolution and about their communication with them, quote, their communications are of an affecting nature being a country of similar possessions. And so Pickney and other South Carolina leaders acknowledge that the Haitian revolution is important to them because that same sort of revolution could very well happen in South Carolina. And so the state government of South Carolina decides to send weapons, to send aid, everything except the state militia. Uh, because I think the folks in South Carolina weren't that desperate to defend slavery in San Domingue. They're willing to send everything else except actual troops, uh, which was probably the smartest thing this state has done uh, up through the antebellum period. Because if they had sent troops, they would have died alongside the French, the British, the Spanish and everyone else who tried to put down the revolt failed at doing so. Now, one thing about the Haitian Revolution as well that I want to point out for a quick second is that one of the critical parts of the revolution is that you have the, enslaved, the slave owners leaving San Domingue in droves in 1791, 293, et cetera. And they're fleeing to ports all over the Western Hemisphere, including most notably New Orleans, Savannah, and Charleston. Now, I point this out because when the enslaved are brought to places like New Orleans and Charleston, you can actually go online, read newspaper accounts of slave owners in Charleston saying, whatever we do, we have to make sure 
that our Negroes do not interact with the Negroes from San Domingue. There was a fear that there was this revolutionary contagion that was in the air at that time uh, that was, some argue, was, was going from France to San Domingue to the U.S. Others argued it was related specifically to the enslaved in San Domingue. But there was this serious fear that the enslaved being brought from San Domingue to New Orleans and the, the Charleston and elsewhere were bringing with them these really crazy ideas of freedom and liberty and independence. Or I, I should say, to be more specific, they were crazy ideas when they came out of the mouths of Black people. When they came out of the mouths of White people, they created the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and so forth. But Negroes saying this, no, I mean, no, that's, that's a bridge too far. But I, I want to point this out, too, because the, the institution of slavery is something that, as I've said before, and we'll talk about it again this evening, it touches virtually everything in South Carolina's politics, and by extension, the South politics. You really cannot think about the South as an idea, the South as a political bloc, the South as a power broker in the U.S. government without thinking of the institution of slavery. This is why the collapse of slavery in San Domain was such a shock to the system of slavery all across the Western Hemisphere. When the slave revolt in San Domain began, and when it achieved quick successes on the battlefield, to the point where revolutionary France is essentially forced to acknowledge the slavery in San Domain, Many white Americans observing the Haitian Revolution from the US are saying we have to make sure that that sort of revolt does not happen in the American South. If it does, the fear is Americans won't be able to stop it, especially in a place like South Carolina that had such a large enslaved population. Now, this is a map I always put to my students at Claflin about the institution of slavery. And I think it does a good job of illustrating how slavery as a political issue really shapes the country. This is actually a map showing what the U.S. looks like in 1820 um, on the eve of Denmark, D.C.'s slave conspiracy or revolt, and how the country is equally divided between slave states and quote unquote free states. But you want to think about how this division in the country is really going to govern how the country works internally from the Constitution of 1787 until 1860. Now, it's important to note, too, that even after the Haitian Revolution comes to an end by 1804, the fear of slave revolt is, is near constant across the South. And these are images of, of two revolts that some of you may have heard of and some of you may not have heard of. Uh, one is Gabriel Prosser's rebellion in 1800, uh, which was a, a slave conspiracy to sort of revolt in Virginia. Now, what makes this one interesting is that, unlike with Denmark DC's uh, conspiracy, Prosser's rebellion was really close to actually happening. Um, the problem, as the, the sign, the marker here points out, is that the day the rebellion was supposed to occur, there were heavy rains all across Virginia. It made it very difficult for the enslaved people to, who were gonna revolt to actually travel and communicate and such. They caught up a rebellion, but some of the enslaved folks panicked. They told their masters about the rebellion and it led to the rebellion being suppressed. In 1811, you have the German Coast Rebellion in Louisiana, a rebellion that comes awfully close to reaching New Orleans. Um, now, the, the German Coast Rebellion is not as well known as, say, the Marbesis Conspiracy or even the Gabriel Prosser Revolt, but the German Coast Rebellion is actually the largest attempted slave revolt in U.S. history. It's even bigger than that Turner's Rebellion. Um, what caused it to collapse, however, is that the militias in Louisiana are able to stop the enslaved before they reach New Orleans. Um, eventually, enslaved are forced to retreat. Many of them are actually captured. And quite a few of the enslaved revolved in the German Coast Rebellion are beheaded, and their heads are placed on pikes um, and put on display outside the city of New Orleans. 
But I mentioned this because we get to Denmark, D.C., you have to remember that leaders in South Carolina are not just thinking of D.C. in isolation. They're thinking of D.C. in relationship to these earlier attempts at slave revolts. The fear of slave revolts across the South is not simply a theoretical construct for, for, for white Southerners. White Southerners have actual revolts to look back onto to say, if those had been suppressed, where would we be right now? Whether it's Stoner Rebellion, the German Coast Rebellion, Gabriel Pusser's Rebellion, or most notably, the success of the Haitian Revolution itself. And even in South Carolina, uh, there were fears of slave revolts that were spurred on by the fact that there were various thwarted slave plots before 1822. In places like Columbia or Camden, just as a couple of examples. Uh, now I will admit with these slave revolts, uh, I've only come across cursory acknowledgement and evidence of them and other readings about South Carolina history. Um, but what is clear is that even before Denmark DC's revolt or attempted revolt, there were other moments in the history of South Carolina after Stono where white South Carolinians were deeply concerned with the potential of another slave revolt taking place. And so we actually get to Denmark DC himself. And this is actually a map of, of Charleston Harbor in the early 19th century. Now the thing about BC, for those who don't know, uh, is that BC himself was born into slavery. He was eventually able to purchase his freedom. And by 1822, he is part of a, you know, a not exactly prosperous, at least a, a strong and, and prideful uh, free black community in Charleston, South Carolina. Now BC is also part of a black run church in Charleston, uh, one of the earliest African Methodist Episcopal churches found at South Mason Dixon line, which was created right here, right in Charleston, South Carolina in the 18-teens. And you have to understand that the relationship between free blacks and slave blacks in Charleston and throughout the South was really an important part of why white South Carolinians were so afraid of free blacks. Across the South, there was never really a trust of the free black population, which was a very small percentage all across the region. Don't no mistake about that. But to be a black person in the South in the 19th century, at least before the Civil War, was to be seen as someone who was either enslaved or should have been enslaved. The idea of a free person of color was really seen as an anomaly as something that was unnatural to see across the South. And yet folks like the Mark D.C. and others did exist. They did uh, try to prosper whenever they could. Now, the thing about Denmark D.C. Is, is, is this. And I think we had this conversation some last week talking about D.C. Um, but what is important, though, amongst historians today is that there is serious debate about whether or not there was actually a full-blown conspiracy to spark a slave revolt in place when Denmark D.C. and his co-conspirators were captured and executed for the supposed crime of planning a slave revolt in 1822. Uh, for many decades, many generations, the idea of there being conspiracy was taken for granted. But in the last 60 years or so, maybe even earlier than that, numerous historians have gone back to primary sources, namely looking at court case documents, looking at the testimonies of those involved in the conspiracy and so forth. And the conclusion that has been reached uh, by many, and this is most recently noted by, by Lacey Ford, a story emeritus of USC, is that there likely was not a full-blown conspiracy led by D.C. But the importance of Denmark D.C.'s conspiracy is in the fact that white Charlestonians were so afraid of a potential conspiracy that they felt something had to be done in 1822. Again, you cannot look at the Denmark D.C. conspiracy in isolation. You have to remember that 
the last 20 years before that, uh, white Charlestonians had experienced the Haitian Revolution. They had encountered so-called refugees from San Domain who brought their enslaved Africans along with them. They had heard about Gabriel's Rebellion in Virginia. They had heard the Jumering Post Rebellion in 1811. And going back to Dr. Adams' presentation last week, they were also well aware of the Maroons living in Congaree, folks like Joe, who were essentially marauders going throughout the low country, uh, pillaging plantations, selling food from plantation owners and slaves and like. And so Denmark DC's conspiracy, even if it wasn't a full-blown conspiracy, even if Denmark DC himself had only begun dreaming up and thinking of ways to destroy slavery in Charleston. The story of Denmark DC is more important in the fact that it showcases just how much fear permeates white Charlestonian society in the 19th century. I would submit to all of you in this class that one of the key ideas of the Majestic Simpkins School, when we're talking about the history of South Carolina, is how much white fear drives everything happening in the state, whether we're talking about laws disallowing slaves from reading or writing, whether we're talking about the laws put in place after Denmark BC's conspiracy is supposedly uncovered, or if we're talking about the rise of Jim Crow segregation, this white fear of Black people, of Black revolt, of Black success, it, it's a big driver in the history of the state. And in fact, on the screen is one of the chief physical symbols of that fear, the Citadel. This is actually a photograph of the Citadel around 1843 or so when it was actually founded. The Citadel was one of the creations in the aftermath of Denmark DC's conspiracy. Again, this worry about a slave revolt drives the creation of the Citadel uh, in the 19th century as a place to train South Carolinians to potentially put down a slave revolt. In the aftermath of Denmark DC's revolt, however, not only is the Citadel built, but you also have additional laws being passed by the state government. For example, uh, there is a Negro Seamen Act passed in 1822, which basically says if you are a black sailor on a ship coming to Charleston Harbor, you have to report to the city authorities and be placed in jail for the duration of your stay. Why? One of the fears that was part of the Mark BC's conspiracy was that BC himself was conspiring with black sailors from ships coming in from across the world. There was this belief that black sailors weren't to be trusted, that they brought again, the contagion of liberty and freedom with them from whenever they had gone to before. And so when they would come into Charleston Harbor, they were told to report basically to jail as soon as they arrived. The US government steps in and tells Charleston, South Carolina, hey, you can't do that because that violates the rights of sailors across the high seas. And it, you know, it could start a war if you aren't careful, depending on which ship you decide to stop and which sailors you decide to jail and imprison. But Denmark BC's revolt really shows you where South Carolina's political mind is in the 1820s. Um, while the state is deeply concerned about defending slavery, it's going to see opponents to slavery virtually everywhere in virtually any piece of legislation you can think of. There isn't a single issue that the politicians of South Carolina cannot tie back in some form or fashion to slavery itself. All right. Okay. Now, this concern over slavery in South Carolina, of course, brings us to one of the most important South Carolinians in the state's history, John C. Calhoun. Now, the, the painting you see here of Calhoun is probably not one you see very often. We usually see Calhoun uh, we see him in a later painting from his life or a photograph, uh, but this is John C. Calhoun in the 18-teens, early 1820s. Now Calhoun's career, I would argue, is actually symbolic of many of the careers 
that future South Carolinians will, will have international spotlight. Individuals like Ben Tillman or James Burns or Strom Thurmond or maybe even Lindsey Graham. Individuals who have immense power in South Carolina become symbols of the Palmetto State the rest of the country, but can only ascend to a certain high point in a nation's politics because of their, their staunchly pro-South Carolina stance. Calhoun's a good example of this. I would argue James Burns, another good example that we'll get to later in the semester. But Calhoun, when he began his career in the 1810s in Congress, he was actually known as a staunch nationalist. Uh, he becomes a, a huge backer of the War of 1812, seeing it as an opportunity for the US to expand in the Canada and out West uh, against the British and the indigenous tribes respectively. He served Secretary of War uh, for two presidential terms and is even Vice President of the United States. Yes, John C. Calhoun at one point in his life was a heartbeat away from the presidency. Something that you shouldn't think about too much before it keeps you up at night for the rest of the week. But um, what is important about Calhoun is that while he begins his career as a staunch nationalist, being in favor of strong internal improvements, of building up the US Navy, of an aggressive foreign policy and such, over time, Calhoun decides he has a choice to make. He can either be staunchly pro-nationalist or he can be pro-South Carolina. He cannot do both at the same time. And his power base in South Carolina is primarily concerned with South Carolina. He's going to soon find out himself. Now, this brings me to why Calhoun is so important. And I think we've already made mention of this a few times in the class. Um, so I know Brett and others have mentioned on a few times, on a few occasions the last few weeks, this idea of nullification, or nullification theory. And I think some of the students in the class have even brought it up in, in Q&A sessions. And so I want to go ahead and tackle it right now. Nullification theory is essentially the idea that state governments actually have the constitutional right and authority to nullify federal law. This is an idea that actually harkens back to the 1790s uh, with the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions uh, written by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and others, where they argued that the federal government's powers and authorities could be on certain occasions superseded by state government action. Now, Calhoun's going to take those ideas and run with them and craft the idea of nullification, um, basically saying that a state government does have the right to nullify federal law if it so sees fit, excuse me, to do so. Now, nullification theory gets its first big test in the 1820s, um, thanks to the tariffs of 1824 and 1828. Now, I know that folks are probably thinking, okay, why the tariff? Why is it a big deal? Keep this in mind. In Congress in the 19th century, up until the Civil War, at least, most of the support for tariffs came from northern states because they were concerned with defending growing heavy industry in the north, you know, still uh, iron making, so on and so forth. In the south, there was a lot of opposition to tariffs because Southern plantation owners want to access the world markets to purchase the cheapest possible tools for the enslaved Africans to use. And so tariffs actually become a proxy for North and South debates over the power of the federal government. But as Calhoun himself acknowledged in one of his letters, he said that the tariff of 1828 was, quote, the occasion rather than the real cause of the present unhappy state of things. What Calhoun's really saying is that we're debating the tariff today, but we're trying to craft nullification against potential anti-slavery policy down the road. By the 1820s, the population of South Carolina was once again majority enslaved Africans. And by the late 1820s, arguments over defending slavery was starting, starting to harden more and more throughout the South, especially in South Carolina. 
that's going to lead to a confrontation between South Carolina and the federal government by 1832. And it's going to put Calhoun in a really awkward position because Calhoun, as you might recall, was still vice president in 1832. He's going to be forced to resign from that office and return to South Carolina and run for the Senate to show his loyalty to the Palmetto State during the terror crisis of 1832-33. Now, I have often joked with my students at Claflin that nullification crisis of 1832-33 for horror fans in the audience was like an American history version of Freddy versus Jason. You have John C. Calhoun on one hand and Andrew Jackson on the other. And of course, Andrew Jackson, uh, even before he was president, was not exactly the most savory character in American history. Uh, he was a slave owner. He was an ardent champion of westward expansion. Uh, he deeply despised indigenous peoples, so forth, got into various duels, killed a bunch of different people, so on and so forth. Almost everything you could say bad about a person could be said about Andrew Jackson. And yet, somehow, he becomes historically the hero of nullification crisis because he basically tells South Carolina, if you refuse to collect the tariff, we will send US troops in the South Carolina to do it for you. Now, at that point, the state government of South Carolina and John C. Calhoun, who was safely back in the Senate at this point, after having left the vice presidency, decide to back down. A Big reason why they backed down, though, and I want you guys to all keep this in mind, we'll get to 1860. A big reason why they backed down is that the rest of the South tell South Carolina, look guys, you're on your own. No other Southern state is willing to stand side by side with South Carolina during this crisis. In addition to that, Andrew Jackson was president. He had already sent troops to North Carolina and the border of South Carolina threatening the state government with action if they refused to collect the tariff. And there was a real fear in South Carolina that if they made the wrong move, President Andrew Jackson would send the army in and that would be that. And so the state government stands down, they uh, agree to President Jackson's terms. And then soon afterward, uh, after the troops have left and after everything has calmed down, the state government of South Carolina passes another resolution saying, Okay, we, we let Jackson do that, but we still think nullification is a good idea. They basically say, if we wanted to, we could nullify the tariff, but we're being nice, so we won't do that this time. Now, as I said before, you, you want to all keep in mind one really big question, and, and I often warn my students, when you're studying history, you don't want to think about what's coming next. I, I, I think we're all thinking about, well, this is all leading to the Civil War. How did we get there? D to understand it, you should really think of, well, how are people in the 1830s experiencing these events? They don't know a Civil War is coming down. Some of them suspect it will come, but they don't know when or how. Still, it is worth asking ourselves the question, why was there a Civil War in the 1860s, not, say, in the 1830s? Again, a big part of that is that South Carolina is seen as sort of an outlier when it comes to defending slavery. The South is united around the issue of slavery, but the Palmetto State is seen as being even too extreme for other Southern states. Nonetheless, the ideas behind slavery are also evolving in the 19th century. So let's rewind for a second back to the late 18th century, to the age of the early republic and the constitution and the new nation. The men arguing on behalf of slavery in the late 18th century, like Thomas Jefferson, for example, they would have told you they took no satisfaction, no joy being slave owners, that instead they felt it was necessary evil that was propelling American society forward economically. If, if you ever read some of the documents from Thomas Jefferson, the letters written by George Washington, you would almost get the sense that they thought the enslaved just fell out of the sky to these plantations, just started working there, just automatically, instead of the fact that these men were engaged in a system 
of buying and selling men and women. But by the 1830s, the ideology of defending slavery has changed from just necessary evil, it's just the way things are, to this is a good thing, this is morally just, and we're going to use everything to defend it, whether it be the Constitution, whether it be Greek Roman philosophers, whether it be Christianity, we're going to use these ideological tools to say slavery is actually just and fair and a good thing. This brings me to James Henry Hatt, who is without question one of the most pernicious and frankly unsavory characters in the history of South Carolina, which if you know, South Carolina history is saying a lot. Um, and I guess what I mean by that in just a second, but, but Hammond, he is a governor, he's a senator from the state, and he proposes what's called the mud seal theory. This is his theory of how human relationships should work. And he uses the history of slavery in ancient Greece and Rome as his examples. He tells an audience that if you look at the history of Greece and Rome, the places that Americans compared themselves to the most in the 18th and 19th centuries, Hammond argued, well, ancient Greece and ancient Rome also utilized slavery as well. If we're going to pattern ourselves after those pillars of Western society, why can't we acknowledge slavery as an important part of that as well? And in fact, his mudsill theory is a way to look at how society, his opinion, should work. And the quote here, I think, is illustrative of that. Quote, in all social systems, there must be a class to do the menial duties, to perform the drudgery of life. It constitutes the very mudsill of society, end quote. And for those who don't know, the mudsill is often the, the lower base upon which a, a house or a home is built. You need a mudsill as the, the foundation, and everything is built on that. Hammond's arguing slavery is simply that for Southern society. Without slavery, the South simply could not exist. Without slavery, cotton could not be king. And by the way, worth pointing out, Hammond was also the guy who coined the phrase, cotton is king. So again, these ideas of uh, economic development and growth on the one hand, and the ideas of butt cell theory and how society should be structured on the other, they are very tightly linked together. And men like James Henry Hammond began to propose, propose this more and more in South Carolina and nationally as a bulwark in defense of slavery. Now, very quickly, I want to make mention of the fact that Hammond was seen as an unsavory character even by the standards of his day. Uh, he was known for sexually assaulting several of his enslaved women. Uh, his wife briefly left him for that reason. And Hammond was also notorious for having raped several women from the Wade Hampton family. Um, so much so that Wade Hampton III, who we'll discuss later in detail in this course, publicly accuses then Governor Hammond of raping some of his relatives. It actually hampers Hammond's political career for a decade, but after that, he is allowed to return to the Senate and resume his powerful duties there as well. And so Hammond, he is, I think, symbolic of many of the things that abolitionists and others were fighting against in 19th century America. This Mudsill theory is a really powerful one though. Um, and it helps to explain why, in, along with how much money is coming out of slavery, why more and more white Southerners are the, the, defending slavery more and more strenuously during the 19th century. In the late 18th century, if you would talk to, say, Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or a James Madison, even one of the Pickneys, they would have said, you know, we could see slavery ending in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You fast forward 50 years later, and you have a James Henry Hammond basically arguing that slavery should exist in perpetuity. The defense of slavery becomes a, a chief ideological point for many Americans during the antebellum. But it's not all pro-slavery advocates in South Carolina. With abolitionism, 
slowly but surely on the rise across the country in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, you do see folks like the Grimke sisters you see here who are starting to become many very forceful advocates against the institution of slavery. Now, what's interesting is that the Grimke sisters, originally from Charleston, originally from a slave holding family, their father was a powerful pro-slavery voice in the US. But the Grimke sisters saw it as their religious duty to stand against slavery and to stand against oppression. And so they are forced, they leave South Carolina and they really can never come back to the state because of their, their forceful anti-slavery stance. But the Grimke sisters become part of a larger network of abolitionists based primarily in the North who, starting in the 1830s, become really powerful voices against slavery. Now, since this is a course that is dedicated to training teacher activists, it is worth noting that the abolitionist movement in the United States never really gained majority support until slavery itself was finally destroyed in 1865. But folks like the Grimke sisters, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, Frederick Douglass, Martin Delaney, so many others, they understood that while they were abolitionists, they were in the minority, they also understood that that in itself did not lessen the moral power of their voices and of their activism in the fight against slavery. And one of the lessons I think we'll all take away from this course on human rights and the history of human rights in South Carolina is that whether it's abolitionism or the fight for human rights in the 20th century, understanding that you're up against incredible odds makes what we all do in this course all the more important. If you were an abolitionist or more directly than slave person in say, I don't know, 1850 Charleston. You may assume that for the rest of your life, you're going to be enslaved. And then suddenly in 1865, you're not. Now how we get there is, is a really important part of the ninth class, but the abolitionist movement faced a lot of opposition, North and South against ending slavery. But folks like the Grimke sisters felt it was still an important and perhaps even the violently ordained mission to actually fight against the evils of slavery. But it is also uh, worth noting that as I've said before, so much of the country politics revolve around the issue of slavery one way or the other. Let's take, for example, the war with Mexico in the 1840s. Now, I'm sure some of the folks in this class have taken a trip to the state house grounds here in Columbia, South Carolina. If you've not, you should do so. Uh, there are a lot of interesting monuments and statues there, um, albeit many of them to slave owners, to ex-Confederates, to segregationists and so forth. I'm sure that's a coincidence. But there is on the State House grounds a memorial to the Mexican War as well that you, you all should take a look at if you have a chance to do so. And when you see that memorial, when you take a look at this um, coin that commemorates the Palmetto Regiment that fought in the Mexican War, you should keep the following in mind. When the United States goes to war with Mexico, in 1846, following the Texas Revolution of the 1830s and 40s, many Northerners, many abolitionists argue against the war and say this is a war not only to expand westward, but designed to incorporate new slave states into the Union. Many Americans vociferously oppose the war in Mexico. This is why, if you look at the Mexican War's statistics in terms of who serves, a majority of the volunteers in the US Army are actually from the South, including the Palmetto Regiment from South Carolina. Now, when the war is won by the United States in 1848, with the terms 
of America's westward expansion are finally realized. There is a sense across the country that the US has made a terrible mistake. Even no less a figure than John C. Calhoun, uh, who you see here in his latter day visage as a villain in a Harry Potter movie, he notes that perhaps this was a mistake. And this is a direct quote from Calhoun before he passes away in 1850. He said, quote, the day of retribution will come. And when it does, awful will be the reckoning and heavy the responsibilities somewhere. Calhoun was actually summarizing the thought many Americans had about the Mexican War. And I'd be glad to talk about this more in Q&A afterward. But what Calhoun and what others feared was that this naked war of aggression against Mexico, which expanded the power of slavery in the US, would come back to bite the nation and bite it back. In fact, if any of you ever have the opportunity to read Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs, that he wrote in the 1880s, Grant actually has a paragraph where he writes about the Mexican War and argues that the American Civil War was God's retribution for America's reckless act of aggression against Mexico in the 1840s. Again, consider that once the US brings in Texas as a slave state and begins to debate about other Western territories as free or state territories, you really have the acceleration toward civil war going on in the 1850s. Now, in the 1850s, the US Congress is going to come up with a series of compromises. Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, so forth, that are designed to basically stave off the idea of civil war over the institution of slavery. However, those compromises only briefly work. And by the late 1850s, it is becoming clear that compromises are really running out of time. So I'll give you uh, a quick example of how much things have deteriorated in Congress. In 1850, Congress comes up with the Compromise of 1850, which was a piece of legislation, really four parts that was designed to deal with the new territories incorporated into the US after the war in Mexico. Make a long story short, California was brought to the Union as a free state. Other territories were deliberated upon at a later date, but the Fugitive Slave Act was also greatly strengthened as well. When the Compromise of 1850 is signed into law in 1850, the assumption is we've saved off of the war, we've solved the issue of slavery for all time. Which is, of course, why by 1854, you have to have the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which decided that um, Kansas we brought into the Union or brought into the Union as either a slave or free territory based on the idea of popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty being the idea that people living in a territory had the right to vote on either being a free or slave territory it was seen as the masterstroke of democracy and so forth. But that compromise also fails because folks moved into Kansas for the express purpose of voting for either slavery or freedom. And by 1856-57, Kansas is experiencing a guerrilla war, which becomes a proxy for a larger national question over slavery. And so this brings us to the Hall of Congress itself. And in 1856, you have a serious debate on the floor of Congress over slavery. Charles Sumner, the well-known, well-regarded senator from Massachusetts, gives a speech on the floor of the Senate where he is basically making personal insults and remarks at South Carolina's uh, Andrew Butler. Um, however, what happens is that Preston Brooks, um, Butler's nephew and a congressman from South Carolina himself, hears the speech and is incensed by what he sees as Sumner's very nasty remarks about Butler, about the Palmetto State, about slavery, about everything near and dear to Preston Brooks' heart. And so Congressman Brooks walks to the floor of the Senate the following day, approaches Sumner's desk, and tells Sumner that 
essentially he is there to avenge his his uncle. And Brooks proceeds to hit Sumner upside the head with a cane, not once, not twice, not three times, but numerous times, greatly injuring Sumner and basically knocking Sumner out of the Senate for close to 18 months. And this picture you see here actually portrays the, the, the caning of Charles Sumner. As you can tell, this is from a Northern newspaper because it says Southern chivalry, arguments versus clubs. Now, the curious thing about the aftermath of the caning of Charles Sumner is that in the North, abolitionists, anti-slavery advocates, even folks who don't give two dams about slavery, they are just stunned that a person was beaten almost to death on the floor of the Senate. So of course, in the South, Preston Brooks is a regional hero. And in fact, Brooks receives hundreds of canes in the mail from admiring Southerners who said he did a good job. In fact, some actually wish he had finished the job and killed Sumner outright. But this shows you how even in Congress, the question of slavery is becoming one that no one congressman or no coalition of congressmen can no longer hope to actually contain. And again, the, the issue of, of slavery and of violence over slavery is hitting for Congress. It's leading to a guerrilla war in Kansas between pro and anti-slavery factions. John Brown rises to prominence because of this violence in Kansas. And in 1857, the Supreme Court enters into the fray as well with this Dred Scott decision of 1857, where Judge Roger Tawney makes the argument that A, people of African descent have no right to be citizens in the United States, and B, he argues that even though Dred Scott had been moved into a free state, that did not entitle him to freedom. That in fact, slave owners could actually move their quote unquote property anywhere they wish to without having to fear losing said property to anti-slavery laws in those states. In the aftermath of the Dred Scott decision, and this is zooming out from South Carolina to the entire country, what I want folks to understand is that after Dred Scott, there are millions of white Northerners who again, had no love for African people of African descent, did not consider themselves to be opposed to slavery, but they were deeply incensed by the Dred Scott decision. They felt it went too far. They felt it infringed on their state's rights to, to ban slavery or the grant freedom of those who fled their states. And by 1860, the political situation across the country has deeply hardened. Remember, the mudsill theory and other theories like it across the South are making compromise for white Southerners almost impossible in the issue of slavery. While the North, things like the Fred Scott case, uh, leading Kansas, the canning of Charles Sumner, they were also angering millions of white Northerners as well and making them um, less and less likely to accept any compromise on slavery. Now, this um, all, all sets the stage for the election of 1860. And by 1860, we've also had John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry and what is now West Virginia, where Brown attempts to actually take over a federal arsenal and distribute weapons to enslaved Africans in the area in hopes of foment a slave rebellion there. Now, what's interesting about John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry is that he approaches, among others, to help him, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. Now, Douglass says, I get where you're coming from, but this is probably not a good idea. Again, Douglass was no physical coward. He had been in this fight before. He had fought pro-slavery advocates with, with his fist before, but he thought Brown's idea, while well-intentioned, was misguided. Harriet Tubman, on the other hand, uh, the, the great abolitionist, and the woman who led hundreds of slaves to freedom, she was actually game to do it. She actually agreed to help John Brown, but on the day of the raid, uh, Tubman herself was actually seriously ill. She could not help John Brown with this raid. And so John Brown and his men, including some uh, Black Americans were captured during the raid uh, by ironically enough Robert E. Lee, the US Marines, 
and eventually John Brown's compatriots were executed by the state of Virginia for treason. Now, the response to that in the North was to see John Brown as a hero, which again horrified white Southerners, because again, Brown was trying to foment the thing they all fear more than anything else, which was a slave revolt. And so when you get to the 1860 election, and stop me if you've heard this before, many Americans see it as the most important election of their lifetimes. Something that's been said every four years for the last 20 years at this point in our own timeline. But in 1860, it really was the most important election of their lifetimes. Now, take a look at the map, just a, a quick second. And this is where I get to use my uh, political historian skills for a moment. If you notice, um, you see that Abraham Lincoln, the Republican nominee for president, has won all the states in red. But if you look at the popular vote, Lincoln only wins about 40% of the popular vote. The issue is that the Democratic Party fractures along regional lines. So you have a Southern Democrat in John Breckinridge running for president, a Northern Democrat in Stephen uh, F. Douglas running for president. And then you have John Bell runs for an independent third party called the Constitutional Union Party. The Democrats in short, in short shoot themselves in the foot repeatedly during the election. Uh, their first convention in Charleston in 1860 falls apart because many of the Northern delegates are stunned by how much their Southern counterparts do not want to um, compromise on slavery. But when Lincoln wins, his victory is one of the things that folks in the South were always afraid of. They were always worried that the North population would eventually unite behind a purportedly anti-slavery candidate and get that person over the finish line. And for the first time in US history, that is precisely what happens. Lincoln's Republican platform in 1860 does not argue for the banning of slavery where it exists, but it does argue against the expansion of slavery out to the West. This is too much for South Carolinians, too much for many white Southerners. Lincoln is not even on the ballot in many Southern states in 1860, and yet he still wins. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that one of the things that really hurt South Carolina during its nullification crisis was that no other Southern state was willing to take that extra step and stand by South Carolina. In the so-called secession winter of 1860 and 61, however, states across the South, quickly after Lincoln's election, hold conventions to debate what to do next. South Carolina in December of 1860 becomes the first state to secede from the Union. And this is actually the ordinance you see here that announces that in the Charleston Mercury, one of the most staunchly pro-slavery papers in the country. But quickly after South Carolina secedes from the Union, they send couriers out across the country, across the South rather, to see what other Southern states are going to do. United by a fear of Lincoln's election, united by a disdain for the abolitionist movement, and certain that cotton was truly king economically, and that it could get support from Britain and France, other Southern states begin to secede from the Union in the winter of 1860-61, leading, of course, to the American Civil War. Now, let's see. Hey, Brett, you know, if you if you want, I could take some questions now and pick up the Civil War at eight o'clock. Um, so if there are any questions for me right now about this section, feel free to put them in the chat. Okay, where is the Denmark DC statue located? Uh, it's actually located in Charleston. Um, it's actually in Charleston. There was a big debate over whether or not to put one up in the first place, but it was placed, I think, in the last few years back. It's a, it's a relatively new statue. Any other questions about the antebellum period before we get to the Civil War? Civil War won't take too long. Dr. Breen, I wanted to yes. tell people that 
that they're how lucky they are to have you as a teacher. I've been taking this class for seven years, and you continue to find other colors in your palette to make our history become clearer to me. It's just amazing. I, and so I say, that's it for Dr. Graves. Well, thanks. I, well, part of it is I know there are some students here who've taken the class before, but also I keep thinking about different ways to teach this. Um, and, and actually, some of the questions in the chat point to why I made these changes. So I see Greg's question, uh, did you mention the Fugitive Slave Act as a precipitating, precipitating cause of the war? It, it, it definitely is, um, and for this reason. Number one, when the Fugitive Slave Act is ratified in 1850 by Congress, part of the larger compromise of 1850, uh, many Northerners see it as an attack on their state's rights to decide how they want to handle the issue of fugitive slaves. In fact, you have numerous stories during the 1850s of cities like Boston, Philadelphia, and other places where white Northerners were actually blocked U.S. Marshals from getting to enslaved people, bringing them back south. Now, if you study the uh, slavery ordinances, the, the secession ordinances written by South Carolina and other southern states in 1860-61, one of the things that South Carolina specifically mentioned is their anger at the federal government for not enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. They say that the, the Northern states, New York, New Jersey, et cetera, they are not holding up their end of the, as a matter of fact, let me, I know I wanna get to the next section uh, pretty soon, but I want to show you guys, um, let me just, give me just one second. Uh, I want to go ahead and show everyone, well, I'll find it later. But if you look at the actual, um, secession ordinance from South Carolina, the wording specifically mentions the Fugitive Slave Act not being enforced by Northern states. Okay, the Citadel was a response to the, the DC conspiracy. Yes, it was. Uh, the Citadel is built partly because of the fear of another attempt at a Denmark DC like conspiracy. It takes time for it to be built, but it was built essentially to to stop a potential slave revolt in South Carolina. Okay, Katie asks, in the image of the German Coast Rebellion, it looks like they are carrying American flags, why? That's actually a, a really good question. Um, let's go back to that image just for a quick second, because I think it is a, a rather powerful one. Um, I do wanna show an image again. Uh, so this is the picture that Katie is referring to here. Um, you know, why are they carrying American flags? Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, I would suggest part of it is because they're trying to show how they're using America's ideals for their own slave revolt. I mean, some of the enslaved are aware of the Declaration of Independence. They are aware of these ideals of liberty and freedom that have come from the American and the French and the Haitian Revolution. And in a way, this is showing how they're just trying to be part of that tradition. Also keep in mind, this is an artist rendering. Um, so they could be taking some liberties with what's actually going on. And finally, I would also suggest it could just be they've captured a US flag and, and they're showing their power as they march towards New Orleans. Again, with the German Coast Rebellion, uh, this enslaved group, it's, it's about a few hundred men strong they get really close to New Orleans before they're forced to turn back. And in fact, today in Louisiana, they actually hold a reenactment of German Coast Rebellion, except in the reenactment, they actually make it to New Orleans. And they actually have like a big party in New Orleans afterward to kind of say, well, what could they have created if they had made it to New Orleans during the slave revolt? Again, it's a really fascinating story. Okay, a couple more questions. Please speak on Hammond's mistress and daughter. I'd rather not, but I will go ahead and do so. Um, so. So the thing about James Henry Hammond, as I said before, uh, he was a particularly unsavory person. Um, he sexually assaults several of his enslaved women who work in his plantation. Um, I believe he even has a daughter by one of them at one point. Um, Hammond is, the thing about Hammond is that he is the chief example of how 
sexually depraved, many of these slave owners, I, I'm not even exaggerating because in his diaries, he openly writes about sexually assaulting slave women, women in the Wade Hampton family, um, and, and so forth. And he is the kind of person who even other South Carolinians look at and, and say with disdain that this person should not be part of polite society. Now, despite all of that, he is powerful enough to, even after it's publicly acknowledged he's done these things, he returns to the Senate from South Carolina anyway, uh, which I think is, is rather telling. Okay, another quick thing. Uh, what's the Haitian Revolution impact on Georgia and the Battle of Savannah? Was well, so South Carolina supportive of the Senate? Okay, this is a good question. All, all great questions. So in the 1770s, after the French formally allied with the United States during the War of Independence, uh, one of the first things the French do is they send a detachment of, of Haitian soldiers from Saint-Domingue to Savannah to help protect Savannah during the siege of Savannah in 1778-79. There's actually a statue, in fact, in Savannah dedicated to those Haitian troops that still stand, excuse me, to this day. Um, now, the thing is that South Carolina really did not have much of a say in the use of Haitian soldiers, um, mainly because South Carolina was concerned that if Savannah fell, Charleston would eventually fall as well, which is what happens. Savannah and Charleston are both captured during the Revolutionary War. In Georgia, of course, it was support for Haitian soldiers. But to your point, um, this is actually part of the reason why South Carolina was so nervous about the Haitian Revolution, because they knew how those Haitian soldiers wore during the War of Independence and feared seeing that kind of thing uh, being used against the American army during the Haitian Revolution. Okay. All right, so those were some of the questions on the antebellum period. Uh, now what I'm gonna do is quickly transition to the Civil War. This actually won't take very long because we're gonna say Reconstruction for next week, but I do want to cover the Civil War uh, in South Carolina. So let's go ahead and get to that. Let me also turn the lights in my apartment in just one second. Voila. Okay. So, Robert, while you're oh, adjusting yeah, your ahead. lighting, I want to mention Louisa McCord at some point before we start shooting each other in the Civil War. Oh, go ahead, please. <laughs> I, one of the things that I found most amazing in my studies of this particular period in time, uh, the, I mean, 1848 was the Communist Manifesto. Um, I had no idea that there was an anti-socialist argument predicated for by the pro-slavery forces this is it an anti-socialist argument in the united states of america in the 1850s predicated on the anti-slavery and the spokesperson was a woman named louisa mccord in columbia south carolina dr green you want to take it from there oh dr green's gone to adjust oh, well, the lighting <laughs> no this is this is actually well i i think what i would only add to that and, and you can you give some detail as well, but it is an interesting point to consider because we think about how in the 20th century, socialism is often tied to civil rights for a variety of reasons, but as Brett is pointing out in the 1850s, the first mention of socialism in Congress is during a debate over slavery. And there's this fear that pro-slavery congressmen are using of ideas of socialism to argue against ending slavery. Um, now, on the flip side, it is worth noting that if you read some of Karl Marx's writings from that era, the 1850s and 1860s especially, Marx and other communists are coming out strongly against slavery. And in fact, during the Civil War, Karl Marx writes favorably of the Union Army and the Union cause Mm -hmm. arguing that destroying slavery in the U.S. was an important stepping stone to destroying the exploitation of labor across the world. Uh, but, Bert, did you want to add any more to that? So just that Louisa McCord was um, a woman who um, was unusual at the time, and she became uh, more engaged than women were 
and particularly her husband had owned a big plantation in, in, in South Carolina and um, became kind of a national spokesperson for a pro-slavery movement at the same time that this anti-slavery movement was being pushed. But she was in Columbia, South Carolina in a house that now belongs to Henry McMaster, our uh, governor. A little footnote. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question before I get back to the Civil War. Did Hammond's Mudsill theory explicitly build off other imperialist theories or caste systems that subjugate by race, class, and religion? Well, what, what Hammond was really doing, he was explicitly making appeals to America's love of ancient Greece and Rome specifically. If you look at his actual speeches and, and writings about the Mudsill theory, his big thing is really talking about how the fact that the US, since it modeled itself after ancient Greece and Rome in its institutions, literally in its architecture in Washington, DC, his argument was more based on the, on the historical idea that any great nation needed a base of slaves upon which to thrive. Um, I think I would, however, agree with you that, that Hammond's theory is certainly linked to other ideas that are around the 19th century about the need of, of white Europeans to dominate the rest of the world uh, through, through racial supremacy and the like. Certainly Hammond is not running away from that, that he's, he's sort of embracing those ideas and combining them with his understanding of, of ancient history to give an argument to Americans about why slavery was not only good, but why slavery was good in a purportedly democratic system of government. That was one of the things abolitionists pointed out. He said, how can the U.S. say it's the land of the free and the home of the brave? And James Henry Hammond saying, well, we can, because to build that kind of system, you need a base of slavery to do so. You need to oppress and subjugate another group for our prosperity to continue and to endure. So on that very cheerful note, I am now going to uh, very briefly covered the Civil War, and, and I, will, I will let folks know right now. Um, while I could do a whole series of lectures about the battles of the Civil War, about the campaigns in the Eastern and Western theaters, about why Ulysses S. Grant is a better general than Robert E. Lee, this Civil War lecture is not quite about those things. It is very much about the experience of South Carolina during the Civil War, which is gonna become very important for talking about reconstruction. Now, of course, the Civil War begins in South Carolina with the uh, rebel attack on Fort Sumter in April of 1861. And we're actually coming to that anniversary pretty soon, as a matter of fact. So actually right now, today, of course, is March 21st. March 21st, 1861, uh, Abraham Lincoln has been president for only a couple of weeks. And he is waiting to see what the new Confederate government is going to do about one of the few remaining federal ports or federal bases in the South, Fort Sumter. Basically, the, the federal government and rebel government were playing a game of chicken. They were trying to see which side was going to make the first move. If Lincoln was waiting to see would the Confederates attack Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter and the folks in the area were waiting to see, will Lincoln take any aggressive moves to resupply Fort Sumter? What Lincoln does, as you may already know, is he resupplies Fort Sumter, daring the Confederates to attack the base. The Confederates do so in April of 1861, and the war begins shortly thereafter. Now, it is important to note, when the Civil War began, even though the cause of the war, if you look at many of the ordinances of secession, if you look at the debates held in legislatures in the South in 1860-61, the cause of the war is clearly the defense of slavery by the South. Leaders on both sides of the war in 1861 agree that slavery status will not change. When the war begins, President Lincoln asks the volunteers, he rallies the northern part of the nation to war, but he also insists he's not going to touch slavery where it already exists. He's not going to disrupt slavery where it is, he simply wants to restore the Union. However, events in South Carolina are going to force the federal government to rethink that idea, rethink that strategy. 
Now, this is an artist's rendering of the U.S. Naval Bombardment of Port Royal, South Carolina in November of 1861. Now, Port Royal is one of the first places in the South to fall to federal forces in 1861. And what the federal troops found left them with a serious dilemma. Now, here's a map of the Port Royal area, in case you aren't familiar with it, it's just to the south of Charleston, uh, right next to Beaufort, and just north of Savannah. When the federal troops disembarked in Port Royal, November of 1861, they discovered two things. The plantation owners had left the area, number one. And number two, thousands of enslaved Africans had been left behind abandoned by their owners. In 1861, there was not yet a federal policy to answer the very simple question of what to do with enslaved Africans if they were, say, found behind federal lines, if they had fled to federal troops during the heat of battle. There was no federal policy about this. In places like Missouri, John C. Fremont, for example, had actually announced that he would free enslaved people that he came upon in combat, and President Lincoln quickly forced him to rescind that order. But in Port Royal, the federal government decides to try an experiment, um, really pushed by abolitionists to do so. Again, you have thousands of the formerly well, enslaved people their legal status is unclear. They aren't quite free. They aren't quite enslaved. They simply are. They are simply there in Port Royal. And federal officials decide, let's see what they will do if they are encouraged to work. Now, keep in mind, even in the North at this time, there was a widespread opinion amongst most white Northerners that, in, that Africans had to be forced to work, that if they were left on devices, they were docile, they were lazy, they wouldn't apply themselves to work unless forced to do so. This is a stereotype that is going to outlive the Civil War, Reconstruction, it's a stereotype that's really still with us in 2022. And yet, in Port Royal, abolitionists from New England come down and they asked the federal government to be allowed to work with the formerly enslaved to see if these formerly enslaved Africans will actually work without being forced to work. And to the surprise and shock of even some of the most ardent abolitionists, these black men and women raise their families, they apply themselves for education, and they work harder than they work for their lives because for the first time in their lives, they have something to work for. Now, for those of you who have, may not be aware of, uh, if you go to Buford today, there is a National Reconstruction Park there. It's the only park of its kind in National Park Service. Um, nearby is the small town of, of uh, uh, Mitchellville as well. These are places that commemorate the Port Royal experiment and reconstruction year after year after year. But as you saw in your readings with the Port Royal experiment, it really becomes a question of what the abolitionists believe the, the formerly enslaved Africans need versus what the newly freed Blacks in South Carolina actually want. The abolitionists are convinced we should teach them about the glories of capitalism, uh, the glories of participating in the free market and so forth. Whereas the blacks in Port Royal are saying, well, you know, actually all we want are some schools, a decent chance at life, some land and to be left alone. These ideas often clash and the paternalism of some of the abolitionists is on full display during the Port Royal experiment. Still, what makes the Port Royal experiment so important is that it does show officials in Washington, DC that after the war is over and if slavery is destroyed, there is an opportunity to help these people make a life for themselves 
if they are simply given the chance to do so. And so in Mitchellville, for example, there's creation of a local council of black officials. Uh, again, some of these folks are, are given land for the first time in their lives. It becomes perhaps the most radical moment in the history of the US up to that time. And this is in 1861 and 62. Many historians would actually argue that Reconstruction doesn't begin with the end of the Civil War, it begins in Port Royal, South Carolina in 1861. Now, most of the fighting in the Civil War, as you may already know, takes place outside of South Carolina. Uh, it takes place in Virginia, Tennessee, Mississippi, elsewhere. And again, I, I teach the Civil War Reconstruction course at Claflin. I could spend all night talking about the war itself and the battles and such, but I know we only have a few minutes. So instead, I want to focus on South Carolina itself. Now, during the war, South Carolina becomes one of the most ardent supporters of the Confederate government. However, as the war drags on and the Confederate army suffers devastating defeats in the field, the war gets closer and closer to the Palmetto State in 1863 and 64. Now, I'm a native of Georgia. I'm from Augusta, Georgia, just across the river. So I, I have to mention William T. Sherman. Uh, his march to the sea. And you know what's funny? This is just a, a, a quick aside. As a, as a young boy in Georgia, we learned about the, the march to the sea in 1990s. It was, for this was like a bad thing. Like, oh, this, this terrible federal general marched through Georgia. And I'm like, good. <laughs> it was a good thing that he did that. <laughs> but what's important to note for South Carolina is that Sherman's march from Atlanta to Savannah in 1864 meant for South Carolina that the federal army was right across the river. Now, with Sherman's march at the sea in Georgia, there has been debate for a century and a half over how much of that was Sherman intentionally destroying the state infrastructure, how much of it was Confederates fleeing in front of his path, trying to slow him down, et cetera, and so forth, right? When Sherman exits the Savannah, in fact, he gets there and he decides to spare the city. He doesn't want to really destroy it. But when his troops enter South Carolina in 1865, we have numerous letters in archives from federal troops saying they were looking forward to entering South Carolina because they blamed South Carolina for the entire war. They blamed South Carolina for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans in the previous four years. And they decided when they got to South Carolina, they were gonna have some fun. The culmination of that fun was the destruction of Columbia in February of 1865. Uh, this picture, you, this photograph you see here was taken from the heart of Columbia uh, in March of 1865. And as you can see, there is virtually nothing standing. This is uh, an artist's rendering of the actual burning of, South, of Columbia, South Carolina in February of 1865. With the destruction of Columbia, there is still some debate about who started it. Some believe it was federal troops, others believe it was the Confederates fleeing. Regardless, Columbia is ruins, um, as is Charleston. Charleston, of course, was seen as the very bastion of slavery and secessionist attitudes, and that city was also destroyed at the end of the Civil War. And so, the Palmetto State, which for generations had been the chief defender of slavery from the antebellum period, now found itself faced with the realization that, as one illustrious American would say a year later, the chickens had come home to roost. The state had been completely destroyed, the government had collapsed, and there was anarchy all across the state. Okay. Yet, I want to end with this point. While South Carolina's government has collapsed in the summer of 1865, at the same time, there is a newfound hope amongst many living in the Palmetto State, especially those of African descent. And 
in May of 1865, Black Americans living in Charleston would commemorate the federal debt and hold what is considered to be the first Memorial Day in American history of 1865. If that holiday actually has its origins in Charles where Black Americans were celebrating the end of the war and at the same time trying to give thought and give some sense of meaning to what the war is actually about. And so I want to actually end the class with this image, if I can find it. Okay, well, I can't find it by some deal. But what is important to note is that South Carolina has entered a new phase of its history in 1865. It can no longer defend slavery. But the question becomes, what will South Carolina stand for now? The answer to that question is one thing in 1865, means something different in 1868, means something different still in 1877, and means something totally different in 1895. But that is for our next class. All right. So with that being said, we've got about 14 minutes left. Uh, one thing I do want to say as questions come in in the, the chat section, um, I want to also mention that talking about Port Royal for a second, uh, remember that Port Royal is, is right next to Buford. Um, Buford and Port Royal in that area become really the heart of the Port Royal experiment and also become the heart of Reconstruction era thought in terms of what Reconstruction could and should have been. Uh, for example, you heard Dr. Edwards last week talk about the Freedmen's Bank. Her next book is about that. The Freedmen's Bank uh, had a major branch in Buford, South Carolina, but that was one of the major centers of the Freedmen's Bank in the Reconstruction period. Likewise, we think about the rise of Black political power in the state during Reconstruction, which we'll get to next week. Buford is one of the major centers of that power, both during Reconstruction and for generations afterward, too. Right, so Buford, if you're from Buford, you should take some pride in that, but Buford has a, a starring role to play in Reconstruction next week. So let me take a look at the question. Okay, all right. So I, I like the, I, I think it's funny how I, I said about 10 minutes before that I could talk about battles all night long. Of course, I'm getting questions about battles now in the chat. Okay, so were there any Civil War battles fought in South Carolina? Actually, quite a few. Uh, and this links to question two. Can you speak to the significance of the 54 Massachusetts Regiment and its place in South Carolina? So I can ask both these questions at once. So, yes, there were battles fought in South Carolina during the Civil War. Now, in the early years of the war, 1861, 62, and 63, not that many because most of the federal government's attention is on fighting in Virginia, in the Eastern Front, and fighting in Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, in the West. But by 1863, the federal government starts to take serious efforts to attack positions just outside of Charleston. Again, they have captured Port Royal, right? But what they're trying to do is take the city of Charleston, which is really the South's biggest port city during the Civil War era. It's an area that's still importing slaves. It's still an, era, an area that's importing a lot of goods that the South desperately needs for the war effort. So you do see battles like, for example, the Battle of Fort Wagner in uh, July of 1863. Now, for those who don't know, um, South Carolina actually has a really interesting history uh, when it comes to talking about Black soldiers fighting in the war uh, for the federal government. And what is actually, let me just show you this really quickly, talk about uh, battles here. I want to show you one last thing. This is actually from my Civil War class. Um, but in, in South Carolina, you do have not only battles, but you also have events like the Combahee River, which is in June of 1863, where Harriet Tubman herself leads Black soldiers on a raid deep within South Carolina, which I'll show you where it is, 
to actually liberate a few hundred slaves from slavery during the war. Um, this was a major propaganda victory for the federal government during the war. And it's also an example of how Harriet Tubman was performing a lot of secret services for the federal government during the Civil War. Um, also, later on, we talk about the Civil War in South Carolina. As I mentioned before, the Battle of Fort Wagner, uh, popularized by the film uh, Glory that came out in 1989. The 54th Massachusetts is one of the earliest all Black units formed during the Civil War. It's formed Massachusetts. Um, it's primarily made up of free Blacks from the North who meet in Massachusetts to form a new regiment. However, it is worth noting that before that, there was already uh, an all Black regiment in South Carolina called the First South Carolina Volunteers, which was formed actually partly from, from Black Americans that were part of the Port Royal experiment. Um, and so in the Civil War, you do see Blacks fighting in South Carolina. Uh, you do see battles like Fort Wagner. Now, Fort Wagner is a tactical defeat for the federal government. They aren't able to take the fort of uh, Charleston. But it does show that Black soldiers are more than willing to fight and die for the federal cause. And so Fort Wagner becomes important as a, a rallying cry to say that Black soldiers will fight to the death for freedom and for emancipation. So to answer your question, uh, there are actually quite a few battles in, in South Carolina during the Civil War, and there are many more in 1864, 65. As the, the war is coming to an end, and as federal forces go deeper into South Carolina, you start to see more battles in the Palmetto State as well, before resistance totally collapses in the spring of 1865. Okay, any other questions? Questions at all. And my question keep going to uh, people instead of uh, everyone. Um, I, I I have actually three questions, and I'll try to com uh, combine them. I was wondering about the international response to the Civil War, and if Haiti specifically was able to uh, respond in any way. And um, uh, I just leave it at that. Okay, so the international response to the war. This is a, a rather fascinating question. Um, and oh, okay, before I answer that really quick, let me show you what I meant by the first SC volunteers. This is what they looked like, in case you were wondering. Um, this was the first, the first black regiment in the war period actually began in South Carolina. Many of them were, were Gullah Geechee speakers as well. Um, they, they were known by the distinctive red trousers and that sort of thing. Um, in fact, if you see the film Glory, they're actually in the movie. There's a scene when the 54th comes to South Carolina and they meet these other Black soldiers. And some of them can't understand what the first volunteers are saying because they're speaking a, a Gullah dialect. So that's, again, uh, pretty interesting. But to, to Dr. Goldman's question, uh, this is a rather fascinating one. Uh, and actually, one of my colleagues in South Carolina, uh, Don Doyle has written about this, and others have too. Make a very long story short. One of the chief reasons the Confederacy is confident in the early years of the war is that they are convinced that their supply of cotton to France and especially Great Britain is so important to those nations that sooner or later they felt Europe would have to intervene in the Civil War. And that was actually President Abraham Lincoln's biggest fear. It wasn't so much defeat at the hands of the Confederacy in the battlefield. It was that the war would last long enough to where the European powers would intervene and they would recognize the Confederacy as a separate government. So that's one part of the international problem. Number two is that, and, and Brett actually alluded to this earlier, by 1861 in Europe, there is a general sense that Republican forms of government simply cannot work. Because for one, the revolutions of 1848 had completely collapsed. Uh, attempts at democratic governance across Europe had been crushed by autocracies uh, and autocratic movements across Western and Eastern Europe. Many of those revolutionaries, especially from Germany, were forced to flee 
to the United States. Some of them actually fight in the Union Army during the war, in fact. Um, but there was a sense that democracy simply could not work. And the Europeans were saying, look at these dumb Americans. They couldn't even avoid a civil war over slavery. So of course, democracy cannot work. It's another part in that situation. And finally, to Haiti. So Haiti is interesting because on the one hand, Black Americans in the US before and during the Civil War looked to Haiti as an example of what they could be allowed to do if they can actually fight for emancipation in the US. At the same time, President Lincoln actually formally opens diplomatic relations with Haiti during the Civil War in 1862 because Southern congressmen had for decades held up diplomatic recognition of Haiti before the Civil War. They said it just will not happen. We will not recognize Haiti as a free country. The second the Confederacy leaves the Union, Abraham Lincoln decides to do so. And I see uh, J.A. Rogers in his book, Africa's Gift to America, suggests the Union was losing the war and Africans were allowed to fight. What do you think? Well, let me, answer, let me answer your question in the Abraham Lincoln book. Lincoln actually himself said that if it hadn't been for uh, Black service in the war, the Union may very well have collapsed. Lincoln himself actually said this. And the reason is very simple. 200,000 additional troops, Black soldiers and sailors, fight in the Union Army and Navy during the war. This actually frees up tens of thousands of white soldiers to go fight in front lines from Virginia to Mississippi to, to Louisiana to South Carolina. And many of these Black soldiers themselves are also used in combat in South Carolina, in Virginia, in Tennessee, all over the place. Now, with Civil War historiography, I think many of you have heard that one of the reasons the federal government won the war was manpower. That's true, but it's also a bit misleading. Yes, the federal government, the northern states had more people than the southern states. That is true. But the South had one major advantage over the North, slave labor. They had a labor force of 4 million people they could use at will to do anything from grow cotton, to build trenches, to creating fortifications all over the South. Once you see Black soldiers fighting in the war, and once the Emancipation Proclamation and the goal of emancipation becomes clear federal objectives, the war starts to swing decisively towards the North because they're using Black soldiers and also because during the Civil War, you have over 500,000 enslaved Africans leaving slavery, just walking off plantations, going towards Union lines, and so forth, crippling the system of slavery that was keeping the Confederacy in the war. If, there's, if, the, if the system of slavery had collapsed overnight in the South, the Confederacy would have been forced to surrender the very next day. There was no way they could fight the war without that system of slavery in place. And as folks like W.E.B. Du Bois have argued and other historians since then, there is an argument some historians make of a general strike that takes place in the South, where they argue that the enslaved people of the South were essentially abandoning plantations, they were leaving behind work, and in the process they were purposefully destroying the Confederacy's ability to wage war against the North. So that's a very long way of answering the question and saying, uh, yes, <laughs> the, the Union, the Union, I'm not sure if they lose the war without Black soldiers, but it's difficult to imagine them winning it outright without Black federal service. Any other questions? Dr. Green, I think you've satiated the interest of our students. <laughs> and we, well, I guess we can, we can uh, give a little uh, housekeeping details about what's next. Sure. Uh, the, um, the next thing coming up that all of you need to have on your calendar is this coming Sunday. Uh, it's a special one of our Sunday sessions from 4 to 6 p.m. And um, on your um, study, guide that said that it would be Vernon Burton talking about Lincoln's unfinished business. But Lincoln's unfinished business has to do with combating this 
critical race theory pushback stuff where people are making up making up things to get upset about and so this sunday is going to be the the vernon burton be, will be joined by armin durfner and armin durfner is the i would argue leading living uh, attorney who's uh, successfully fought for redistricting issues and um, black empowerment he's in his 80s charleston lawyer and they have a book out uh durfner and armand do a um they called justice deferred and they're going to lift up the south carolina cases in that book that were went to the supreme court that were defending the cases of the reason they were in the supreme court is they were defending racism in south carolina and so these people that argue that there's no systemic racism in south carolina will be confronted with the reality that well here are your laws and they were beaten in the supreme court so that's sunday this coming sunday at four o'clock and everyone will get a link to that and uh, robert we want to close out in a minute here i want you to say the last few words when nicole freeman who's one of our students that has stepped up to offer something to uh, close the show with and daniel you ready to key that up dr green take us home and then daniel's going to key that up and we got about a three minute thing and y'all those of you that haven't got to ask your questions or intimidated about speaking in front of large crowds stay around and uh, do a little after school chat thank you dr green well, thank you. And once again, I want to just thank everyone for being here this evening. I hope you learned something new about South Carolina uh, and about how horrible James Henry Hammond is. Uh, but again, uh, we'll see you again this, this next Sunday and also next Monday. We'll discuss reconstruction as well. Uh, but until then, uh, glad to see everyone here. And until then, keep on keeping the faith. Nicole Freeman, everyone's clapping. Nicole, I don't, can you hear me? Nicole has signed in on her phone and I'm not quite sure that she's going to be able to, to say can anything about hear, her. Can you hear me okay? We do hear you. Okay, and what it is, yeah. is that we can't see Nicole. She may be shy, but yeah. doggone it, folks, she put herself out here and did something for us. Yeah. A couple, no, tell us about the song, Nicole. I can um, see her. This was a piece that, um, my, my son wrote the music and um, 
he asked me to listen to it and I said, and then I felt also inspired to uh, write the words and sing the song. And we did that all in one night. Uh, and, and so it's special to me because it's, you know, me and my son. And, uh, but um, also um, mostly it's about hope, the, the, the words. Uh, and I think that that also corresponds to what we're learning here. When, when you learn about history, it also gives you hope. So uh, thank you for allowing me to present that. And thank you, Dr. Green, today for, for everything you present. Uh, thank you for a great piece of music. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, hope, definitely hope is what we need. <laughs>